And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the Self Liberator's Paradise. Uh, learn more or become an honorary stakeholder today by visiting Pasnia.com. So, as some know, I released my book, Vanu A Strategy for Self Liberation, in the summer of 2018. Uh, I've yet to release the audiobook for it, uh, but do have someone working on it right now. Uh, the long wait should come to an end soon. That said, in 2018, I did begin production on it and decided I would release it as an unofficial teaser today for the 100th episode of the main podcast feed. You'll get probably about a third to a fourth of the book, roughly an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, if you'd like to snag a paperback copy, purchase on Amazon or download it for free. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vonnie book. All of the links will be there. Again, that uh, link is libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vonnie book. Uh, thanks so much in advance for the support. Uh, I think that's all I have for you today. Um, please check out the website, vonniepodcast.com, for our full podcast archives, best articles, free Vonnie books, and much more. Uh, find me on Float. Library, uh, BitShoot, Twitter, and for now, uh, Instagram. That'll be the next one to go. Uh, and then Twitter uh, soon after that, hopefully. And uh, last thing, please make sure to find Pasnia on Telegram. Uh, you can join our news and updates channel, the uh, Pasnia Free Press, uh, t.me forward slash Pasnia, or our chat channel, the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence, uh, t.me forward slash Pasnia Chat. Uh, you know, those uh, those groups are uh, are, are, uh, are starting to, to uh, liven up, and uh, I, uh, post in, I try to post in there daily. Uh, lots of good stuff happening. Uh, please do um, get involved with uh, what we're doing here at Pasnia. Pasnia. Um, we did uh, did just have uh, this past weekend uh, had a had a little uh, Pasnia Thanksgiving, uh, very Pasnia Thanksgiving here, and uh, yeah, had a handful of self liberators come over. Um, had uh, you know processed a couple of lambs, um, planted some uh, garlic cloves that were, that were uh, gifted from another Pasnia um, out uh, out east. Uh, thank you, Stag. And uh, just a really, really incredible weekend. Um, so please do, um, you know, check out what we're doing here at Pasnia. Um, we're building, uh, I guess we're, we're trying to build, a, you know, a pocket of freedom for, uh, you know, traveling uh, Venuans. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. And a yeah, couple, couple years down the road, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, coalescing into an, into, in, into an intentional community. Uh, but things are happening. Um, things are definitely happening. Um, I think that's all I have for you guys today. Um, please enjoy um, the audiobook, and uh, please do consider picking up a, a copy, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu book. Uh, until next time, guys. See ya. Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation by Shane Radliff. Narrated by the author. Published by Liberty Under Attack Publications. Disclaimer. The purpose of this book is to provide individuals with potential solutions and in increasing their personal freedom. Many of these solutions are perfectly legal, some are in a gray area, but some are outright illegal. That said, neither the author nor the publisher recommend or advocate anyone break the law. If you decide to pursue any solution presented in this book, it is done at your own risk and of your own accord. In other words, be smart and practice excellent security culture. It should also be noted that nothing herein should be construed as legal advice. The author is not a lawyer, nor does he play one on TV. Do your own legal research or consult a professional. Copy left notice. This book is covered by a BIPCONT no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. Further use permission. Please feel free to use, reuse, distribute, copy, reprint, take credit for, steal, broadcast, mock, hate, quote, misquote, or modify this book in any way you see fit. Sell it, make copies and hand it out at concerts, make t-shirts, print it on flying discs, or do anything else because intellectual property is a state-based haven of the weak, the stupid, and those lacking confidence in their own ability. Forward. The search for personal liberation will differ from individual to individual. Once one has decided they desire more freedom than they currently possess living under the state and the servile society, there is no looking back. However, deciding which route to take can be a monumental and overwhelming task. The appearance and strategy chosen will depend on an individual's background, skills, interests, age, finances, and a host of other factors. Navigating these options is made much easier by reading Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation by Shane Radliff. In this short but informative book, Shane dives into a wide range of strategies for achieving an invulnerability to coercion from the state and other hostile actors. From van nomadism to intentional communities, the book tackles the concepts with clear language that will enlighten veteran Venuans and Agoras, as well as those who are completely fresh to all this freedom and self-liberation talk. As someone who has spent the last eight years dedicated to finding a more free way of life, I found it refreshing to see so many great tips and ideas compiled into an easy-to-read manual. I especially enjoyed Shane's comparison of Rayo's ideas and his potential interaction and inspiration of Samuel Konkin III, founder of Agorism. 
Whether you are an agorist seeking to build the counter-economy and the next stage of liberation, a freedom lover who wants fresh ideas for alternative lifestyles, or somehow stumbled upon this material by fated accident, this book provides a number of invaluable resources. I look forward to employing many of these ideas in my own life in the coming years as I continue my path towards the Agora. Thank you to Shane for making the effort to dig up Rayo's writings and keep them alive for the digital age. Hopefully these ideas will see a revival in the larger libertarian, voluntarist freedom movements around the world. Either way, for those individuals who dare push their quest for personal liberation to the edges of polite and acceptable society, this book is guaranteed to become a treasure for many years to come. Derek Bros, The Conscious Resistance Network, July 2018. Definitions Vanu, the condition or quality of, as well as the action of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Vanuer, having comparatively more an invulnerability to coercion. Venuance, in the process of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Venuin, one who has an invulnerability to coercion. Venuist, one who advocates for an invulnerability to coercion. Vanuism, the advocacy of an invulnerability to coercion. Venuum, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion. Venumi, the art of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. Venumer, one skilled at an invulnerability to coercion. Political crusading, a strategy to restore liberty by working inside of the system in order to change it from within. Examples of this are petitioning, writing to congressmen, protesting, grassroots lobbying, running for public office, and voting. Synonyms include reformism and bullshit libertarianism. Security culture, the direct application of the right to privacy. As a strategy to maintain liberty, it is focused on the how of making privacy happen in the real world, given that the philosophical justification for privacy is self-evident, particularly through argumentation ethics. Agorism, a libertarian strategy that seeks to abolish the state through gray and black market activities, thereby developing the capabilities of the agora, an unlicensed, regulated, untaxed, laissez-faire freed market. Second Realm, an updated version of temporary autonomous zones, TASs, essentially the ability to conduct trade and other activities, including vices, in certain areas at particular times without reprisal from the state. TASs were originally conceived of as geographically mobile, like Vanu shelters, yet now it may include cyberspace, such as the deep web. Controlled schizophrenia, the mental state of an opportunistic citizen serf within the servile society who practices doublethink, yet who still acts in his own best interests. Political crusaders are but just one example of this in action. Collective movementism, an aggregate set of behaviors and actions that are aimed towards large-scale socio-political change in the furtherance of specific goals. Examples include the environmentalist movement, the alt-right, the labor movement, the libertarian movement, the public lands movement, the anti-war movement, the gay rights movement, the women's rights movement, and the civil rights movement. The Servile Society a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. In other words, it upholds the collective as superior to the individual. A one-directional isolation of import-export is used to maintain access to the servile society's open but not free trading centers, yet denying them access to a Venuans home through importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the servile society. Legal Interstices gray areas within the law that can be used to violate the spirit of the law while simultaneously keeping the letter of the law. Meantime to harassment, the strength of Vanu, usually expressed in years. MTH is typically used to gauge the profitable viability of concealing a Venuum relative to one's competency at Venumi. Freemate, a relationship style wherein the participants contract with each other individually rather than by way of the state. In other words, such issues are the concern of the people involved and no one else. Bludge, bludgy, a derisive term used by Venuans to describe law enforcers, also called bluecoats, police extortionists, pigs, etc. Section 1. The Philosophy of Vanu. Quote, the basic principle which leads a libertarian from statism to a free society is the same that the founders of libertarianism used to discover the theory itself. That principle is consistency. End quote. Samuel Edward Konkin III, New Libertarian Manifesto. Chapter 1. Vanu, A Brief History and Introduction Since humans have existed on this earth, coercion has been used to control, manipulate, and exploit individuals. It is an unfortunate fact of history. The state uses it to keep their hapless citizenry in line, and private criminals use it to violate the autonomy of their subjects for personal gain. So then, what is politics? Politics is the art and science of managing centralized coercion, plain and simple. 
That being the case, it's no surprise that politics is undoubtedly a counterintuitive way to decrease the amount of coercion in your life. Would you drink a fifth of Jack Daniels to cure your alcoholism? Engage a couple more prostitutes to assist you in overcoming your sex addiction? What about making a few more trips to Vegas as the means for eradicating that dreaded gambling vice? As ridiculous as those may sound, using politics to alleviate coercion is a far more dangerous utilization of this failed logic. It has more far-reaching, unintended, and intended consequences. People's livelihoods have been and can be destroyed by so-called public policy. The state being the apparatus it is, mass murder, democide, the most deadly form of coercion, is always on the table. Thus, the problem that freedom pioneers face is coercion. Back in the 1960s, a man named Tom Marshall, Rayo, resided in Southern California, then a bustling libertarian community. He was a techie engineer, a socially awkward fellow, a marijuana smoker, not too much of a philosopher, but a freedom-seeking libertarian nonetheless. Early on, he spent some time at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, a school teaching the objectivist philosophy laid out by Ayn Rand, well, at its core, first by Aristotle, until his first major venture came about, the Free Isles Project. The Free Isles Project spawned out of the preform inform zine. The goal was to conduct research on the efficacy of setting up a new libertarian nation and the seemingly endless possibilities for freedom if it were to come into fruition. Rayo said, quote, The Free Isle resident would hypothetically have all of the advantages of participating in world commerce while being free from taxes and regulations. Furthermore, a Free Isle, if it were successful, could be a very effective demonstration of the merits of laissez-faire capitalism, end quote. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it was never successful. Hell, it never got past the talking stage. Eventually, the movement subsided after disagreements arose regarding the size and scope of government, the lack of individuals willing to become involved, and the potential ramifications from existing nation-states. As an aside, the latter two are still big problems for libertarian country-building projects today. Thankfully, most of the newer projects are more anarchistic, but the facilitators are often terrible strategists and tacticians. Generally, they fail to learn from history. Rayo, frustrated with the all-talk, no-action libertarians of his day, said screw it, and moved out of his apartment into a camper mounted on his pickup truck. He became a van nomad and began laying the foundation for the most interesting, plausible freedom strategy today. Naturally, though, freedom means many different things to different people. Freedom to a proprietarian anarchist means private property, personal autonomy, and peace. Freedom to a leftist means free health care, free college, and a massive welfare state. Freedom to a conservative means Christianity, it's not really Christianity, Jesus was most certainly an anarchist, the mass murder known as war, and socialist insecurity. Language is quite fluid, which is why Rayo and Roberta, his freemate, proposed a new term, VANU. VANU is an awkward contraction of the words voluntary, not vulnerable, and simply defined is the condition or quality of, as well as the action of achieving an invulnerability to coercion. So with one definition, Venuans avoid the issue of subjective interpretation altogether. You know coercion and violence when you see it. If you make radical lifestyle changes in an attempt to avoid those things, you are a Venuan, as you are taking steps to become more invulnerable to coercion, regardless of whether the perceived threat is corporations, the state, or a crime-ridden hellhole. But early Venuans also had interesting ways of interpreting liberty and freedom. Liberty, as defined by Funk and Wagnall Standard College Dictionary 1968, the reference Rayo used in his book, is a measure of freedom within restraints granted by or through a sovereign power. Freedom, as defined by the aforementioned source, is the widest term, suggesting complete absence of restraint. So, Venuans say that liberty is the general exemption from coercion, and freedom is an absence of coercion. To gain liberty, one utilizes legal interstices, or, as it is more vernacularly known, legal loopholes within the law. And you know what the state does to those, right? If they can, they close them. Damn those gun show loopholes and ghost gunners. Major props to Cody Wilson. Rhea specifically had an interesting take on legal interstices. One of his complaints about van nomadism was that it required reliance on slave tax, driver's licensure, registration, mandatory insurance. So, in order to hopefully avoid the coercion of the bludgies, you have a license plate on your car, you hand the bludgie your driver's license, and you keep your tags up to date. It's providing a safeguard of sorts, but the terms and conditions may change if they smell marijuana, or if the bludgie in question just wanted to beat you for breathing the wrong way. Rayo also had a quite negative stance on utopian fantasies like Ancapistan, a free world, or a communist paradise. Therefore, freedom, the absence of coercion, is a utopian pipe dream. Even if the state disappears, there will still be psychopaths, violent murderers, and thieves. Hence, there will always be coercion. He pursued the van nomad lifestyle for quite a while and realized that it wasn't enough for him. He disliked the aforementioned slave tax because if you have to ask and pay off the state for permission, are you really free? So Rayo decided that the wilderness Vanu life would offer him the most personal satisfaction, and he and Roberta moved into a polyethylene A-tent deep in the Siskiyou National Forest. 
He continued to publish a few Vanu publications, Preform Inform, Innovator, Vanu Life, and wrote for others such as Libertarian Connection, the Eleutherian Forum, and Going Mobile, nestled up in his foam huts under his makeshift tent. His frustration with libertarians in the community at large increased, and all he saw around him were controlled schizophrenic political crusaders, see below. He once longed for Vanu associations, Van Nomad Mobile Communities, Agoras, but his inclination to work with others waned like a recent full moon. As I received more Vani publications from his time, I hope to find out what truly happens. At this time, all I have is suspicion. He began to pursue troglodyte living and practice building underground structures when he mysteriously seized communication and disappeared. All that remains is a portion of a letter he wrote to his correspondent, I think John Fisher, the editor of his first book, dated February 14, 1974. Quote, My thinking has undergone major changes in the last several months on interfacing alternate economics, interrelations in general. I, too, am becoming very dubious as to the value of all libertarian club involvements. We do not intend to use the libertarian club in the future as an avenue for gaining non-anonymous friends or associates, end quote. But the strategy he and other freedom seekers pioneered is still just as efficacious as it was before, and even more so thanks to advancements in technology. So how does Vanu differ from direct action more generally, such as the methods listed on the freedom umbrella of direct action? Well, with many of the strategies on the FUDA, you can more or less continue living the same lifestyle you did before, for example, a 9-to-5 job in the servile society, paying some taxes, etc., and receive some increases in your personal freedom. Vanu, on the other hand, is a lifestyle change. It is a reorganization of your entire life, but the increase in personal freedom is quite substantial, and that's putting it mildly. Examples of these Vanu lifestyles include Van Nomadism and Wilderness Vanu, both strategies Ray and Roberta utilized, Minimal sailboating, intentional communities, mobile or stationary, vonuming in cities, perpetual traveling, and utilizing ethical enclaves. I'll discuss all of these in, in substantial depth below, but first, let's take a look at the few honorable mentions of Vanu by other libertarians. Chapter 2. Rayo's Influence on the Libertarian Anarchist Community As should be evident, Rayo's work was basically forgotten until Kyle Reardon and I launched the Vanu podcast in January of 2017, but Rayo likely influenced a significant popular strategy within anarchist circles, agorism. An innovator in November 1965, Rayo wrote an article titled Self-Seeking Ethical Enclave, Black Markets. He defines an ethical enclave as, quote, Voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when such transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic of the participating individuals, an adherence to the ethical principle of voluntarism, the principle that no one should initiate violence or threat of violence against another. An enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. An ethical enclave is not necessarily a separate geographical entity. End quote. Soraya was an early voluntarist, before the term was even reappropriated, and he was describing what would be more vernacularly known as an agora. He continues, quote, An ethical enclave by existing within the territorial domain of a coercive government is either legal, utilizing interstices and the taxes and regulations of that government, or illegal, operating despite threats of violence. Now he's describing the black and gray markets of agorism, either trading in goods and services that aren't illegal or dealing outright contraband. But he doesn't stop there. What are the differences between ethical enclave entrepreneurs and black market operators? He says that the differences are significant. Quote, the mixed premise black market operator, while violating socialist laws, still holds, at least subconsciously, some of the premises embodied in laws. He may experience a depressing sense of guilt. He may act with the handicap of psychological conflict. The enclave entrepreneur, however, disavows not only the particular instance of initiated violence, but the collectivist morality as well. He experiences an exhilarating sense of righteousness. He acts with the confidence and certitude of psychological consistency. The Enclave entrepreneur, furthermore, is dealing not only with immoral, by their own definition, criminals, but with producers, with moral individuals who are committed on principle to hold confidences and honor contracts. His costs of doing business, therefore, tend to be less, end quote. In other words, he's calling your typical black market operator a controlled schizophrenic, see below. The ethical enclave operator has an exhilarating sense of righteousness as he recognizes the attempted violations of his autonomy and his act of rebellion in restoring it. Furthermore, he discusses the significance of dealing peer-to-peer -peer with like-minded individuals. Thankfully, this is the direction things have been going for about 20 years with open-source technology. Rayo was just, as always, way ahead of the curve. Recall the agorist notion of starve the state, then smash it. Even though ethical enclaves are, one, just an option for Venuans, not a requirement, and two, small-scale focus with no goal of abolition, Venuans are satisfied to coexist in protracted conflict with the state, Rayo still believed black and gray market trading could be a thorn in the state's side. Quote, 
Ethical enclave trading profits participating individuals and promotes liberty in general by reducing the plunder available to the collectivist government. Plunder which should most probably be used to finance further violations of liberty, plus propaganda to rationalize the violations. The potential effect of ethical enclave trading should not be underestimated. Mixed socialist governments direct most of their extortions and regulations at trade. They tax primarily income and sales, but a transaction can easily be taxed only with the cooperation of at least one party to the transaction. Large-scale non-cooperation would render income and sales taxes ineffective and greatly reduce government revenues, an ultimate check on a state's capability for violence against its subjects. An ethical enclave would also encourage growth of a libertarian movement by adding self-interest motivations, end quote. So it sure as hell sounds almost identical to the strategy Sam Konkin, SEK3, proposed. The last question to answer is, was Konkin familiar with Rayo uh, and or Vanu? The answer, yes, undoubtedly. The following four excerpts are from articles published in the Southern Libertarian Review, January to June 1975, all authored by Konkin, all of which you can find online by visiting vanupodcast.com. 1. Anarcho-Zionism. Quote, the preform crowd either browned out or went into escapist trips, such as becoming nomads, troglodytes, or wilderness dwellers. They sought invulnerability to coercion, or Vanu, and preform inform became Vanu life. Recently, it sputtered to a halt, and the paranoia freaks drifted back to civilization, end quote. From that, we can gather that SEK3 was familiar with the Vanuans and their goals, likely from the publications themselves. As can be seen, his perception of them was quite gloomy, to say the least. 2. Carrots and Sticks Quote, before I leave Southern California, let me not slight anyone, but simply affirm that there are many libertarians I know well enough to exalt, but who have not the general fame for their less persistent endeavors, generally due to working for a living and affliction found rarely on the East Coast. And there are others of fame that do not enjoy my personal knowledge, such as Joe Galambos, Natalie Hall and Sky Diorios, El Rayo and Naomi Gatherer, and Lou Rollins, whose good and worthy efforts will someday earn them a more adept chronicler. End quote. So he's highlighting the achievements of various individuals. Two of them being Rayo and Naomi Gatherer, a.k.a. Roberta, Dr. Gatherer, his freemate. Additionally, our conception of Rayo during the 1960s and 70s is that he was not very well known. It seems like he was part of an extremely niche crowd, and if he enjoyed fame, it was not by the popular definition. That being said, the way Konkin phrases that last portion is interesting. Is it possible that Rayo was more popular than we originally assumed? Were, or are there more Venuans than we initially figured? Possibly. 3. Libertarian Strategy 1 Quote, so that we are not condemned to relive it, let's review our history. As of December 1968, libertarian strategy was directed either toward influence of the conservatives or a conversion of the independents. It was wholly educational or retreatist. Robert Lefebvre's Rampart College, Leonard Reed's Fee, Joe Galambos' FEI, Nathaniel Brandon's NBI, F.A. Harper's IHS, and Frank Shotarov's ISI were all educational institutes. The Vanu Lifers, Atlantis Group, and all of Wright's were seeking escape. Except for the liberal innovators leafleting of the Cow Palace in 1964, no libertarians were involved in a political campaign except as deviationist individuals. Many supported Nixon in 1968, but they were clearly of conservative leanings. Ellipses. Many libertarians also turned inward with incessant psychology sessions and in-group self-criticism. This was the movement as reflected in 1972 in, say, New Libertarian Notes, and which could be pieced together from Rap, Libertarian Forum, Reason, Academic Associates Letter, Vanu Life, Freeman, SIL News, Pacific Libertarian, and many local newsletters, end quote. Regarding the first quote, SEK is quite accurate in stating that Vanu Lifers were seeking escape. Although Rayo does discuss Vanu in cities, he notes that, quote, I know of quite a few Vanuists and Libertarians who live Alan Humble's way, but I know none who seem to like it for very long, end quote. This is mainly due to the city psychological pressures of the state of servile society, which is why Rayo prefers to live far enough back in the woods. Other than that minor point, SEK3 is correct. The second excerpt is particularly interesting, though. Unfortunately, the only Vanu Life articles I've read are those found within Rayo's book and any that have arrived in the batches of Vanu publications we've digitized. From that, I certainly don't gather the incessant psychology sessions or in-group self-criticism. Rather, from the entirety of the book, it mainly consists of back-and-forth discussions on strategy, with some philosophy sprinkled in. I'm not sure what SEK3 is referring to here, but it's definitely possible that he's correct. Until we acquire a more complete library of those publications, we'll just have to take his word for it. Number 4. Counter-Campaign 76. Quote, And who could we all agree on without sacrificing our principles? Beyond whom could students of Murray Rothbard, Robert Lefebvre, Ayn Rand, Leonard Reed, Joseph Galambos, Carl Hess, Robert A. Heinlein, El Rayo, Natalie Hall, and Harry Brown unite. Nobody. End quote. The point is this. 
Samuel Edward Conkin III, SEK3, was certainly aware of Rayo and had followed his work. Therefore, we can safely assume with a lot of evidence and similarities that agorism is a reformulation and development upon Rayo's concept of ethical enclaves. Those aren't all the notable mentions of Rayo or Vanu, but we're damn near the end. In the August 1987 edition of Liberty Magazine, two articles discussing Rayo and Vanu were published, one by Benjamin Best titled Tom Marshall Innovator, A Week in the Wilderness, and the second by R.W. Bradford titled The Mystery Man of the Libertarian Movement. The full articles can be found at vanupodcast.com, so I'll only briefly summarize them here. In the first, Best discusses the time he met Rayo in 1967. It was as part of a program Rayo offered called Vanu Week, wherein individuals visited him in the Siskiyou region, Northern California, Southern Oregon, to learn about living the wilderness Vanu lifestyle. It is definitely valuable, yet this article was published 20 years after the fact, and Best was awfully fixated on a woman. It's likely not a 100% accurate recollection of his experiences. The second is more so a retrospective, wherein Bradford discusses the focus of the libertarian community at the time of Rayo, in addition to how far outside the box Venuans were thinking and doing. In regards to Rayo's disappearance, Bradford writes, quote, Some people speculate that he grew weary of his paranoid lifestyle and returned to straight society to live an ordinary life. But others, those who knew him most intimately, believe he succeeded in achieving Vanu, that he continues to live today, deep in the mountains of southern Oregon, living a fulfilling life as a hunter-gatherer, free at last of the oppression of the state, end quote. Knowing Rayo as intimately as I feel I do, there's no way in hell he could have just given up and returned to the servile society. So, my speculation is that he continued living the wilderness Vanu lifestyle, probably mostly in underground structures, until his death. As far as scouring the internet, those are all of the honorable mentions I've found of Rayo and or Vanu. It's worth noting that in Jim Stump's publications, for example, Self-Liberation Notes, Ocean Freedom Notes, and Going Mobile, there are many letters discussing Rayo and or Vanu, but those all took place from the 1970s to 1990s. You can download all of them for free by, again, visiting vanupodcast.com. He certainly had a drastic impact on the libertarian community, even though the majority of the adherents have never heard his name. His contribution of ethical enclaves laid the framework for one of the most popular and efficacious strategies out there today, agorism. For the most radical libertarians of his day, he provided them with solutions in pursuance of personal freedom when most of the libertarians around him were only interested in talking. Man, things don't change much, huh? His work lay dormant for some 20-plus years, but it's back now and with a vengeance. You, the reader, are the modern self-liberator. Chapter 3. The Why to Vanu there are still some more preliminary concepts, ideas, and definitions that need to be covered before getting into the action of Vanu, political crusading, controlled schizophrenia, collective movementism, import-export, and mean-timed harassment. We'll cover the more philosophical ones first, and then move on to the couple that interact directly with the action side. As should be clear by now, Rayo and other Venuans were, and are, actually serious about personal freedom and an invulnerability to coercion, which automatically rules out political crusading, a bullshit strategy for bullshit libertarians. Politics, in fact, makes you more vulnerable to coercion. For example, you're participating in their privacy-unfriendly system. Rayo had this to say, quote, The political crusader who wants to take over or destroy a state seriously threatens the rulers and will bring strong countermeasures. But the libertarian who is satisfied to coexist in protracted conflict with the state is merely an annoyance. The more astute ruler is aware, as is the libertarian, that most people are sheep and will remain sheep no matter how the libertarian lives. Of course, the status would still rather squash a libertarian if this were easy. So, libertarian tactics must be such as to make counter-counterattacks ineffective and prohibitively costly, end quote. Political crusading is also contradictory, speaking in terms of anarchists, or freedom pioneers more generally, consistently living the principles they espouse. Means determine ends, and function determines form. Using the apparatus of the state to achieve freedom shouldn't be taken as a serious consideration by any logical, rational human being. Political crusading is but one example of the social phenomenon of collective movementism. In other words, naive individuals getting together in large groups, working towards mostly unreachable goals. Not only are these mass social movements anti-individualistic as the individual tends to get lost in the collective, but the larger the membership of an organization, the further away from the original goal it gets, often to the point of unrecognizability. Just take a look at the modern libertarian and anarcho-capitalist movements, communities, to view this in action. Both of them started out with quite spectacular aspirations. At the core of these ideologies, private property, peace, and the non-aggression principle, or as Rayo called it, the ethical principle of non-coercion, were tantamount, and the goal is to build a free society. Anything outside the scope of those items is personal choice, and therefore it is immoral and unethical to interfere with those activities of private persons. Anarcho-capitalists took it a step further and said, Okay, 
So government is immoral, and the services they provide are inefficient, to put it mildly. The market could better allocate and manage the use of scarce resources in a peaceful, spontaneous, mutually beneficial manner. So they theorize about the notions of private justice and arbitration, private policing, and private defense, but only one of those things has really ever been demonstrated. Private security or policing by the non-anarchist Threat Management Center in Detroit, Michigan. Fast forward to today, and the big debates in both of these communities are, one, whether or not anarchists should support state and forest borders, two, whether or not we should support Dolan J. Tramp, and three, if we should support Augusto Pinochet-style democide and give our political enemies free helicopter rides. Surely, people are individuals, and there are still great folks who identify with those ideologies. I'm simply speaking of trends. So why does this sort of thing happen? How can people go from relatively decent, peaceful human beings to state-worshipping, contradictory fools? Rayo had a term for this phenomenon, controlled schizophrenia. He only mentioned that term explicitly once, I'll add the preceding paragraph for context, quote, If satisfaction could be plotted with respect to freedom for a large number of people, I think the graph would have a low peak of relative satisfaction around 5-10% to 10 freedom, a higher peak around 90% to 95% freedom, and a wide depression in between. The lower maximum is exemplified in contemporary society by many a successful middle American. He lives conventionally, but takes advantage of some of the easier, more obvious loopholes. He pays income taxes, but hires a tax account to maximize deductions. He registers for the draft, but goes to college in hopes of being made a technician instead of a target. His mental state is one of controlled schizophrenia. He believes most of the status myths in which he was indoctrinated, yet maintains a modicum of skepticism. He goes to church, or at least accepts their standard of morality, but is not above having a drink at a nude bar. He is largely rational in his work, but keeps his rationality compartmented. He does not, dares not, critically examine his life as a whole. Although self-maintained schizophrenia leads to unhealthy and unhappy complications, on the whole, the opportunistic serf may have it better than his more consistent, more gullible, less self-motivated brother, who is drafted and becomes a target, in a paraplegic riding in a VA hospital, or struggling along in a low-paying, high-tax job with a load of installment debts. End quote. Other examples of controlled schizophrenics include anarchist politicians, libertarians or anarchists for Dolan J. Tramp, anarcho-secessionists, state nullification advocates, and political crusaders, generally speaking. All of these folks failed to exercise the collectivist spooks from their head and ended up backsliding into servile society games if they ever gave them up at all. So a sort of formula can be put together. Political crusading plus controlled schizophrenia plus collective movementism equals the state of servile society. The state of servile society is the main enemy of the Venuan, the items on the left side of the equation being elements thereof. So Venuans pursue radical lifestyle changes to become more invulnerable to the coercion of these controlled schizophrenics at large. But how does one gauge whether or not their current lifestyle makes them more invulnerable to coercion and to what degree? Well, right at the outset, Rio formulated the idea of meantime to harassment, which he defined as, quote, the strength of Vanu usually expressed in years. MTH is typically used to gauge the profitable viability of concealing a Venuum, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion, relative to one's competency at Venumi, the art of achieving an invulnerability to coercion, end quote. He includes the following visual aid, which can be found in the Kindle or paperback copy of the book. Since the image isn't the clearest, please allow me to explain what's going on here. On the vertical axis, we have the degree of Vanu in MTH, or number of years a Venuum can predict to live undiscovered. On the horizontal axis, we have the difficulty in concealing a Venuum, the place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion, which is equivalent to the amount of activity within said Vanu shelters, regardless of what type it is. The chart includes summer survival, all-weather survival, Comfortable home, small workshop or laboratory, small manufacturing, light industry, and heavy industry. So the idea is that the less mobile, larger a venuum is, the harder it is to conceal, the higher competency required for the increased activity, and an overall likely drop in the amount of years it will take for it to be discovered. As a venuum moves vertically and horizontally in the chart without increasing activity, while also increasing their competence, their MTH will generally increase. If a Venuan moves vertically and horizontally in the chart, increasing activity without being more competent, their MTH will decrease. In the chart, there are eight levels of Vanu, namely A through H. What Vanu lifestyle changes would be applicable for each? A, B, and C level, wilderness Vanu, bugging out. D level, van nomadism. E level, off-grid, stationary living, for example, tiny home living. F level, small manufacturing, for example, a small workshop. Here's Rayo's personal take on A to C level Vanu. Quote, the diagonal lines represent levels of capability one order of magnitude ten times apart. 
Six years ago, in 1967, when I was becoming seriously interested in Vanu, but had little experience, my competence was roughly represented by line A. Three years ago, after experience with living in a van, competence had increased to line B. Today, our competence level is approximated by C. Thus, at present, we can choose among the following. A small tent, adequate for summer only, in a remote place with 100 years MTH. A larger tent, and more equipment and supplies in one place with year-round access, and a 10-year MTH. The larger tent is also more visible." End quote. There's one other aspect to point out regarding the above chart. The profitable and unprofitable viabilities. What do Rayo and other Venuans mean by this? Well, in short, the further horizontally one goes on the chart, the more equipment necessary, and the more severe the risk of confiscation becomes. Rayo worded it thusly, quote, Within the shaded area, Vanu is not likely worthwhile. For example, total cost of being Vanu will usually exceed the total benefits. The boundary between the viable and non-viable situation slopes downwards to the left, at least under present conditions. This is because, one, the lower levels of activity require much less equipment, and thus a higher probability of confiscation is acceptable. Two, the lower levels of activity are less suspicious and thus unlikely to lead to serious loss, even if discovered." End quote. For that reason, G&H level operations would be huge in scale, making them the least practical, at least for the foreseeable future. Consider Aurora from alongside Knight, a sovereign freeport, and a new libertarian country as examples of these. It's worth noting that there may be some inaccuracies in the above explanation. There's only one article wherein Rayo explains MTH, and I have to go with what's available, as I can't call him up on Skype and get clarification. Nonetheless, MTH is crucial to Vanu, so an honest attempt at fleshing out the idea is at least necessary. One final element critical to determining one's MTH is Rayo's conception of import-export. He says, quote, An optimally liberated lifestyle must involve a sort of one-directional isolation. The liberator maintains his access to their open but not free trading centers while denying them access to his home. A free man obtains information, techniques, key equipment, and supplies out of the servile society, exporting labor or products in return. And during import-export activities, he practices deception, perhaps carries a driver's license, genuine or faked, perhaps pays some sales taxes he cannot conveniently avoid. But the free man's home base is physically concealed. There he spends most of his time. There he may sleep, imbibe, love, design, build trade with fellow freemen, and raise children in relative safety from the savages of state. A free man's home must be a figurative castle." End quote. At one time, Rayo had hopes that a Vanu association or a Vanu mini-culture would come in fruition, which would eventually develop into an alternative economy. Unfortunately, that still does not exist today, since deep web marketplaces in a limited context, which necessitates interaction with the state of surveillance society, at least to a certain extent. Modern Vanuans can only be so self-sufficient. One may have a permaculture farm which produces 100% of the food necessary, a fresh water source allowing him to bypass the need for city water, and he may even utilize alternative energy sources, allowing him to go off-grid. But what if one of these solar panels breaks and needs to be replaced? I suppose it's possible for him to learn the ins and outs of how solar panels work, the components involved, and how to construct it from the ground up, but that doesn't sound like a sufficient use of time when he could spend a couple hundred bucks and get one delivered to his house. And even if this Vanuan in question is able to achieve that, what if the tractor he uses for his farm needs a new engine? If his free mate needs a crown on one of her teeth? Maybe his son needs diabetes supplies? Rayo himself utilized import-exports. He purchased bulk storable foods, replacement glass for the windshield of his van, the polyethylene for his tent, and marijuana for his own personal use, the latter being less important considering his residence adjacent to the Emerald Triangle. The point is, there's nothing wrong with utilizing the state of servile society's open but not free trading centers as long as the aforementioned one-directional isolationism is in place. But import-export isn't only useful for the transacting of goods and products. Since said alternative economy is not in place yet, some Vanuans choose to or must export their labor to sustain their lifestyles. Typically, this is done in the form of freelancing, temporary seasonal employment, trading in ethical enclaves, the black and gray markets of agorism, or basically any other alternative to the servile society's 9-to-5 grind. It's worth noting that security culture is of utmost importance when interacting with the servile society. Keep in mind that society does not respect you as a person. They advocate for violations of your autonomy ad infinitum, and many would like to see Vanuans tossed in cages by the bludgies for simply holding the philosophical positions they do. Rayo's main recommendation for this was to keep the interaction to a minimum, which he did in one way by getting months of supplies at once, yet there are other strategies you can utilize as well. If you're going to be driving to their open but not free trading centers, own an inconspicuous vehicle. For example, a work van draws less attention than an RV if you're living aboard, a Mercury Grand Marquis less than a flashy yellow Corvette, etc. Follow all the traffic laws, have your slave tags up to date and visible, keep your automobile clean, and hardest for me, don't blast metal music for all to hear. Pay in Federal Reserve notes, FRNs, digital currencies, or barter. 
Using a credit or debit card makes your movements more traceable, and if the coercers can find you, they can coerce you. If at all possible, try to find like-minded individuals to trade with. Support anarchists, libertarians, and or venuans, not controlled schizophrenics. Roleplay police interrogations ahead of time in case the bludgies try to harass you. When you're pulled over on the side of the road, it's not time for a philosophy lesson, it's not time to tell the bludgie how evil the institution he works for is, nor is it even time for you to plead your case. You've been put in a coercive, potentially violent situation. Just try to survive the encounter and deal with any fallout after the fact. Utilize the gray man strategy and blend in with your surroundings. Wear basic clothes, don't open carry an assault rifle, have situational awareness, and don't initiate conflicts with others. I'm sure there are others, but that at least gives you some idea. At some point in the future, as Second Realms and Vani many cultures are created, hopefully the need for import-export will be eliminated. But for the time being, if Anuans prefer to avoid subsistence living, some interaction with the Serval society is necessary. All of the philosophy and important concepts out of the way, let's begin talking about strategies and lifestyle changes that can make you more invulnerable to coercion. In other words, quote, Now that a collective movementism, also called bullshit libertarianism and political crusading, has been discredited as a libertarian strategy, it is appropriate to re-examine strategies which treat freedom as an individually achievable way of life and marketable commodity, end quote. You're listening to an unofficial teaser of the audiobook for Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation by Shane Radliff, narrated by the author. To purchase the paperback or download it for free, please visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu book or libertyunderattack.com to check out our full selection at LUA Publications. Section 2. The Practice of Vanu. Quote, whether one will be happier as a free man or as a slave partly depends on the individual, but this choice is not open to most libertarians. Relative contentment and servitude is possible only for those who believe in it. Most libertarians are too independent and well-informed. For libertarians, the choice is between freedom and neurosis. End quote. Rayo, November 17th, 1970, Libertarian Connection. Chapter 4. Setting the Stage for Solutions. So what counts as a Vanu freedom strategy? Basically, any lifestyle change that makes the practitioner more invulnerable to coercion. Ray offered a number of suggestions, but it's important to keep in mind that Vani was years for the making, and that, quote, A lifestyle which was Vani 100 years ago may not be Vani today. Some lifestyles Vani today were not possible 100 years ago and may not be Vani 50 years from now, end quote. In other words, there are no silver bullet solutions, and Vani was implemented on an individual basis. What works for me may not work for you, and vice versa. It's also important to note that some strategies may not have even been conceived of yet, and others may be impossible at present due to technological capabilities, for example, space deading. Let's begin our examination of potential lifestyle changes in pursuance of personal freedom. Chapter 5. Go Gypsy. Now. Nomadic lifestyles seem to be the most efficacious paths toward personal freedom and an invulnerability to coercion. If the coercers can find you, they can coerce you. Constantly moving around can serve as one solution to this problem. There are a number of these nomadic lifestyles, each with its own specific obstacles, initial level of investment capital, and other natural barriers to entry. For the freedom pioneer interested in adventure and traveling, nomadic lifestyles may be the answer. In this section, we'll cover van nomadism, or vehicle nomadism more generally, minimal sailboating, perpetual traveling, wilderness fauna, and mobile intentional communities. Chapter 6 Van Nomadism Van Nomadism was the first strategy Rayo pursued, and for good reason. Not only is it the easiest lifestyle change in pursuance of freedom, but it just so happens to be the cheapest. As evidence of the latter, ask your average individual in the survival society what their biggest expense is. The answer will almost undoubtedly be housing, regardless of whether they rent or own. So if an individual has decided that the van life is the lifestyle for them, how do they get started? There are two paths that come to mind now. Just do it, and put together a plan. We'll cover the former first. Let's say that John has been working in the Survival Society for 20 years and has $100,000 saved up. He may learn about the lifestyle and pull the trigger immediately, as he has already achieved some level of financial independence. So he buys a vehicle, whether it's a van, camper, RV, or whatever, converts it into a liveaboard rig, if necessary, and moves in as soon as possible. More power to John, but this is not the most recommended path. Clearly, van nomadism is a radical lifestyle change compared to stationary dwelling. You'll likely have some issues adapting early on, especially in trying to figure out what to do with the extra 40-plus hours a week not spent in a survival society 9-to-5 job. The likely drastic shift towards being extremely self-sufficient will probably be difficult as well. Also consider the fact that this vehicle won't be connected to the grid. 
He will have to learn how to keep up on his hygiene without running water. He'll probably have to get electricity to his rig to power his devices, in addition to just adapting to living in a space the size of an average bathroom, among other things. One remedy to these problems is to make a plan and take small steps towards the eventual goal of van nomadism. Take my situation for example. Being a poor 26-year-old, I don't have a nest egg to sustain myself for a year or two on the road, let alone the capital investment necessary to purchase and convert a van at this time. Even worse, I have debt to take care of before I set sail for sunnier waters. So, for me, this will be a one- to two-year journey, which I'm becoming more and more okay with, as the more time I take, the more prepared I will be. As Jason Booth, my co-host on the Vaughn Podcast, always says, proper preparation prevents piss-poor performance. Let's take a look at my situation more specifically to see how such a lifestyle could be decided upon and planned for. I first heard of van nomadism back in mid-2016 when I initially came across Rayo's book. It was interesting, sure, but I had no desire whatsoever to pursue the strategy. Reason being, I was extremely passionate about the prospects of finding freedom on the open ocean, minimal sailboating, see below, but unfortunately, I didn't have the investment capital necessary to purchase a sailing vessel, I've never sailed a boat, and I still, to this day, have no idea how to traverse the high seas. So I continued my research into freedom strategies for another two years, still almost entirely unsure as to what my future would hold. Until one weekend on YouTube. Towards the beginning of 2018, I stumbled across yet another van conversion video and ended up spending the entirety of the weekend, and most of the month, watching similar contents. I fell in love with the lifestyle concept and made the decision. I'm going to be a Vanuan van nomad. It was time to make plans and bring this freer future into reality. I started by brushing the figurative dust off the Excel spreadsheet containing my frugality budget I had put together a year prior, but failed to stick to for any significant period of time. I updated my income, adjusted my expenses, and recalculated the amount of money I would have left over. Unfortunately, as I mentioned above, the leftover money was not going to savings or my new home on wheels, but was actually going to First Realm Banksters in the form of credit card debt, and at the time of publication, still is. However, there was and is still plenty to do in the meantime. Namely, make frugality a habit, get rid of a bunch of stuff I had no need for, minimalism, adjust my diet to what I envision it being on the road, for example, little fast food, no microwavable meals, less meat as it is an expensive source of protein, etc. Conduct market research on vans and take some for test drives to figure out what feels best to me, ponder and plan the van conversion, see below, research the best, most affordable, easiest to configure off-grid energy setup, build up my freelancing portfolio, generate a handful of passive income streams, this book being one of them, and probably even a few other things, but you get the point. Even if you aren't ready to live your chosen Vani lifestyle now, there are always things you can do to prepare for it. The above list are all things I'm currently doing, as I'm still paying off the aforementioned debt, although I'm getting closer. Once that account is closed, the fun truly begins. Let's talk about those next steps and considerations purchasing a vehicle for living aboard, the conversion itself, making money on the road, potential legal interstices to exploit, and the modern van nomad community. Choosing a vehicle for living aboard. This is a crucially important step, but that goes without saying. Not only are you purchasing a vehicle, but you're purchasing your mobile home on wheels. The vehicle you choose could very well make or break this lifestyle. It could take you on the most incredible adventures and provide you with a significant increase in freedom, or it could lead you down a road of misery. Recall the saying, proper preparation prevents piss-poor performance. What sort of considerations should be taken into account? First and foremost, space. How much room do you need to live relatively comfortably with most, if not all, of your belongings? If you'll be vonuing with others, how much more additional space will be necessary? In other words, would upgrading from a Chevy Astro to a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter van, a super common choice, be enough, or are you now in the realm of campers, RVs, or schoolies? Regardless, you're going to have to get rid of some stuff. Frugality and minimalism are requirements for most of the nomads. Secondly, your purpose. What is your purpose for pursuing this lifestyle? Are you going to be a van nomad living in a large city with various squat spots? Are you looking for the most isolated, beautiful wilderness locations? Maybe you blend of both? Regardless, this is extremely important. If you're pursuing the former, you'll constantly get harassed with a massive Class A RV. They'll run you out of town one way or another, whether it's the bludgies or the hostile nature of the servile society to alternative lifestyles. Instead, you should find a vehicle that is suited for stealth camping, whether that is a work van or box truck. On the other hand, if you're looking for wilderness adventures, your vehicle will need to be outfitted differently, although it would still be wise to configure it in such a way that you can stealth camp if necessary. Thirdly, your budget. Do you have a large amount of investment capital, or are you like me and looking for something on the lower end price-wise? There are benefits and drawbacks to both, just as with anything in life. If you can afford a new or newer Sprinter van, you might be better off by not having to worry about breakdowns or repairs for some time, and you may have a more luxurious home on wheels. 
but you also have to pay for full coverage automobile insurance on a $30,000 vehicle. Repairs will likely be more expensive as well. One vlogging couple I follow spent $15,000 replacing the engine in their Sprinter. Granted, they were in Mexico. Additionally, newer vans come chock full of electronics and those can fail. If they do, you'll likely not be able to fix it, and even if you are able to, you probably won't have the tools and instruments necessary to do so. They're typically expensive specialty parts, making you more reliant upon the survival society. If you're traveling through the barren desert, far away from civilization, and a sensor malfunctions on an otherwise perfectly functioning vehicle, you might be dead on the side of the road until help arrives. The more features, the more that can fail. It's worth noting the computers and possible internet connectivity in newer vehicles. These can certainly be used to track your location, making you more vulnerable to coercion, not to mention that these computers can be hacked remotely to take over your vehicle. Recall the bizarre death, murder, of journalist Michael Hastings a few years back, in addition to, I think, the Vault 7 leaks in late 2017. Granted, I highly doubt any of Inuin would make themselves such a target where that could actually be possible. If it were, they probably wouldn't be of Inuin, huh? With older vans, there are less electronics, making them easier to repair yourself. Parts are everywhere for these vehicles, too. Sure, breakdowns can still be expensive and painful, but you'll probably be in a better financial position when it's all said and done. The most common vans that fall into this category are Chevy Express work vans, Dodge conversion vans, and Ford E-Series vans. Fourthly, fuel. Diesel engines typically get more miles per gallon when compared to unleaded engines of the same size, but they can be more difficult for the average individual to work on, depending upon the vehicle in question. Do some market research of your own and discover what will work best for your situation and applicable expertise. Lastly, two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. In my search for vans so far, this has not been a major focus. Reason being, a two-wheel drive van could get me mostly anywhere I'd want to go, and if I were ever to get stuck on a beach or something, I would have the tools on hand to get myself out. Oh, the things you learn from van nomads on YouTube. That, and from what I know, 4x4 vehicles are more expensive. At this juncture, it's not a necessity or preference for me, but it might be for you. Fantastic! Enjoy those paths further off the beaten path. It's also worth mentioning two other possible vehicle choices, a standard car or minivan. Believe it or not, there are quite a few van nomads living out of these super small spaces, some of them out of necessity, some by choice. If you don't need much, maybe you just decide to hit the road in your Ford F-150 with a topper like one of my Patreon patrons does, or maybe you toss a mattress in the back of your Honda Odyssey and see where the road takes you. To close out this section, let's get into a little philosophy. Most everyone has heard of the quote by Benjamin Franklin regarding trading liberty for security. Similarly, there is a trade-off between freedom and comfort. Stationary dwellings are quite comfortable. You have air conditioning in the summer, heat in the winter, hot showers twice a day, a flushing toilet, and all of the electricity you could ever use and more, but you are inherently unfree, as all of the comforts you enjoy are provided by someone else. Ray and Roberto were a living example of this trade-off, only their choice was on the other end of the spectrum. Wilderness Vanuing in the Siski was quite miserable at times, and they said as much. But they were free, both in the physical sense and also according to their mean time to harassment. Clearly, most individuals would not be interested in wilderness faunu, me included. So the idea is to strike a balance between freedom and comfort, and thanks to technological advancements, that is quite easy to do nowadays. As an example, in my van, I'll have a sink powered by a pump, enough solar power to run all of my devices, internet access via a mobile hotspot, and free Wi-Fi when available, and some sort of a shower system, probably a solar shower. Sure, they may not be as convenient as in my stationary dwelling, but I choose to sacrifice those comforts in pursuance of freedom. All of that said, this freedom versus comfort dichotomy certainly comes into play when choosing your vehicle for living aboard. A two- or four-wheel drive van can go a lot more places than a long, slow, and clumsy Class A RV. Choosing one of these larger vehicles will limit your freedom of access to many of the most beautiful, isolated places. But maybe that's okay for you. A few final considerations to leave you with. If you're going to be buying an older van, make sure to check the undercarriage for rust. Look out for water leaks as they can lead to mold. The holes can be fixed and mold removed, but it can be a major pain. If you're buying a used vehicle, it might be wise to take it to a trusted mechanic before purchasing. If you're planning on gutting the back of the van for the conversion, don't pay too much attention to stains on the carpet, torn upholstery, etc. These vans, campers, and RVs are everywhere. For the latter two, the best time to buy, I think, is in the winter after, quote, people return from their summertime escapist rituals and put themselves away in their boxes for another year, end quote. Now you're ready to purchase your mobile home on wheels. The Conversion You purchase your mobile home on wheels. Congratulations. What's next? Well, converting it to a liveaboard rig. This is the part in the process where you will plan, design, and build out your new abode. It's also the part I'm most looking forward to, in all honesty. 
If we decide to go the RV or camper route, this might not be as relevant to you, but there will likely still be some modifications since you will be living aboard full time or close to it, rather than just using it for weekend getaways. Therefore, the following information should still be valuable. This is the part where YouTube will be your best friend. Reason being, many van nomads upload videos chronicling every single step of the conversion. I also point you in the direction of the old Vani publication, Going Mobile. See additional resources below. Most of the zine is dedicated to letters from van nomads back in the 1960s to 80s discussing their rig, living situations, obstacles, etc., but there are also diagrams, pictures, and tutorials on the conversion itself. For most, the conversion process consists of getting a future living space, performing a deep clean of the entire vehicle, patching any holes or leaks, getting rid of any rust, dealing with any mold, etc., running the wires for the electricity, installing the roof fans and or vents, insulating the van, both the floor and the walls, sometimes the roof, laying down the flooring and putting up the walls, and the rest of the build-outs, for example, whatever you decide upon. Obviously, this process may vary depending upon the individual and the situation, but these are the main steps. Important notes. Make sure to run the wires for the electricity before installing the insulation and the walls. Also, don't half-ass your electrical setup. Do it right the first time. Pay an experienced electrician to help you if need be. It's cheaper and less painful than your mobile home going up in flames from some silly, avoidable mistake. What are some other considerations to take into account? What are your needs? This is the most important question and will determine the complexity or simplicity of the process. If you've never lived out of a vehicle before, you probably won't know the full answer to this question. Therefore, it is recommended that you take practice runs before moving aboard. This way, you can determine whether or not this lifestyle is for you, in addition to discovering what you really, truly need. Some individuals go with bare-bones conversions. For example, John may decide to toss a mattress in the back of his minivan, grab some gallon jugs of water, some food, and a camp stove and hit the road. Others, like Carl and Jala, a Vanuan fan nomad couple traveling Australia, go all out with the conversion. You can view images of their exquisite rig in the paperback or Kindle versions of this book, but I would recommend checking out the van tour. Their website is comfortablylost.com. You can find links to all their social media accounts there. As you can see, Carl and Jala spent quite a bit of money on their van and the subsequent conversion, easily more than $50,000 in total, an expensive car but a cheap home. But you don't have to spend that much. Hell, you can spend as much or as little as you want. I've seen conversions ranging from $500 all the way up to $20,000. Most van nomads will fall somewhere in the middle, but that doesn't mean you can't have a beautiful, functional, and comfortable mobile home. Here are some features you'll undoubtedly add during your conversion. A bed, a kitchen area, possibly a cooking stove, and a sink. Be sure to vent this outside to avoid carbon monoxide poisoning. Storage, lots and lots of easily accessible storage space. A way to dispose of human waste. Some sort of a system to keep up on hygiene, for example, a shower, wet wipes to hold you over until your next visit to Planet Fitness, etc. A roof vent, electricity source, gas generator, solar power, wind power, etc. Blackout curtains for privacy if you have windows. Locks inside and out for safety and privacy. Here are some other important considerations to take into account. Make sure everything is secured in the vehicle, the big, heavy things most importantly. You don't want your belongings launching across your vehicle in transit, and God forbid if you were to get in a high-speed accident, you don't want those to turn into projectiles. Use lightweight materials when converting your vehicle and keep track of all of the weight you'll be adding to it. Try your best to keep it under the maximum recommended weight. Reason being, overloading your vehicle will impact the handling, braking, gas mileage, etc. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, though. Keep in mind, pursuing Vanu is a lifelong endeavor. As you gain more experience and become more competent, you will always find ways to improve upon your Vanu home base. Hence why many YouTube band nomads have multiple conversion series on their channel. I could go into a lot more depth, but considering the communication format of this medium, I'll stop here and turn you over to the modern van nomad community on YouTube. They're seriously a helpful bunch. Making money on the road. Most individuals pursuing van nomadism will be leaving their full-time job in the servile society. Some will have savings enough to live for many years, and others will have to find ways to make money on the road. Looking at damn near 100 different case studies, van nomads, the average cost per month of this lifestyle is $500 to $1,000 a month, or $6,000 to $12,000 a year. This includes the following core expenses. Car insurance, food, gas, Planet Fitness membership, AAA membership, cell phone plan, mobile hotspot optional, basic health insurance, vehicle repair, and maintenance. There will likely be additional expenses, but those will be determined on an individual basis. For example, I need to factor in diabetes supplies, test strips, insulin, vape juice for my vape pen, and medical cannabis, as I will first be venturing out to Colorado in an attempt to cure or at least treat this dreaded autoimmune disease. Some may fear the unknown. How will I make enough money to survive on the road? Now that you know the average cost of this lifestyle, I hope that fear has been quelled at least to a certain extent. 
It's not difficult to make $1,000 a month, the higher ends, if you're willing to work. So what are some ways to generate that income? First off, as I mentioned above, many Vanuans utilize temporary and seasonal employment. When I venture to Colorado, I plan on taking temporary jobs at ski resorts, free lift passes, but it's not limited to that, of course. This is a terrific option for Vanuans. Please allow me to explain below. Situation. An individual takes a three-month seasonal position at the going rate of $10 an hour. He nets $400 a week, $1,600 a month, and $4,800 for the entire gig, the theft known as taxation not included. If he or she is living on $750 a month, that comes to $2,250 in living expenses during the time of the temporary position. That leaves the individual in question with $2,550 in savings, or three months of the van nomad lifestyle when it's all said and done. So, hypothetically, a van nomad could take two, three-month-long seasonal jobs a year and live comfortably while having the other half of the year open for adventure. That sounds like a sweet life, right? It puts the two weeks of vacation, servile society benefit to shame. But there are other avenues available to van nomads, like creating self-liberational media. Believe it or not, van nomadism is kind of trending. You could leverage that to make some additional income by starting a YouTube channel, a website, or a blog. You could write a book and sell it, etc. One cautionary note. YouTube has been known to shut down and demonetize channels for no reason at all. Get well to get as good as the saying goes, but do not rely upon it. The smart Vanuan will never rely upon one single source of income anyways. Digital nomadism more generally is probably the most popular way van nomads make money on the road. This typically consists of freelancing or an entrepreneurial business of some sort. Do you have any marketable skills you could leverage? Think graphic design, website design, coding and development, online marketing, or a consulting biz. These are in demand and businesses and corporations often hire freelancers at higher rates as it is a lot cheaper than hiring a formal employee. There are three other potential options I learned about from other van nomads. Apparently, individuals have had some success with posting gigs wanted ads on Craigslist and Facebook, option one and two. If you're rolling into town and need to make some extra cash, you might try that. I've heard the money isn't always great, and that it can sometimes turn into some tedious odd jobs, but regardless, it's an option if you're in a crunch. The third option is actually quite incredible for van nomads. Delivery and driving services like Uber, Uber Eats, Postmates, etc. If you're ever in a crunch and need to make some money, find a larger city and do some delivering. As long as you have a smartphone, you're almost always in a position to make money. That's huge. Quitting your job in the Servile Society can surely be daunting. It can put your life in question and cause a lot of stress, but it doesn't need to. The van nomad life is quite cheap, and there are seemingly endless ways to make money on the road. The only limitations are your creativity and imagination. Jurisdictional Arbitrage, Legal Intercises, and Tricks for Van Nomads Jurisdictional arbitrage is defined as the practice of taking advantage of discrepancies between competing legal jurisdictions. This is generally practiced between countries and nation states, but it can be applied here in so-called America as well. Similarly, legal interstices are defined as gray areas within the law that can be used to violate the spirit of the law while simultaneously keeping the letter of the law. Take my unfortunate current place of residency, the communist state of Illinois. This hellhole is most well known for being home to the former crime capital in the world, crippling business regulations, a higher price to pay for anything you want to do, and a mass exodus of citizens into other legal jurisdictions. So what sort of jurisdictional arbitrage methods and interstices are available to me and other van nomads? A legal mailing address, vehicle registration, and residency. The state of South Dakota must seriously be hurting for revenue. In most states, the process for these things is difficult, expensive, time-consuming, and there are always hurdles to jump through. Thankfully, South Dakota wants your money so bad, they will jump through the hurdles for you, making it easy to become or remain legally compliant. The first item to discuss is the legal mailing address, as this is a requirement for all of the others. One of the logistical issues with a nomadic lifestyle is mail forwarding. You might not always know where you're going to be, how long you're going to be there, and if what is being delivered can be earmarked for general delivery. Enter yourbestaddress.com. For $189 a year, you can set up custom shipping schedules. For example, if you're going to be in Denver, Colorado for a few weeks working a short-term gig, you simply put in a request to have your mail forwarded there. There are other features, such as $1 handling fee per shipment, lowest out there, free junk mail sorting, email notification for outgoing mail, no hidden postage fees, and even a couple other more minor ones. Better yet, this isn't a mere post office box. This is a legal, physical mailing address, and the first step for the other interstices this website offers. Next is vehicle registration. Here in Illinois, it costs $128 for me to register my 1998 Mercury Grand Marquis yearly. In South Dakota, it's $45, and you can mail in the necessary forms using the address you signed up with before. You don't even have to physically go to the state. Here's the process. Application for motor vehicle and registration, an original title or manufacturer's statement of origin if new, properly transferred to the applicant, 
a bill of sale, sales contract, or purchase order, vehicle weight, empty, a copy of your current driver's license, the current odometer reading. Obviously, the bureaucratic bullshit sucks, but it's something you'll have to deal with regardless. That's not all, though. Here in Illinois, the excise tax on a new or used vehicle is 6.25%. In South Dakota, it's 4%, with no vehicle inspections or emissions tests. Let's say you decide to buy a brand new Chevy Express work van, which comes out to $30,000. In Illinois, the excise tax would be $1,875. In South Dakota, it would be $1,200. So utilizing yourbestaddress.com could net you a savings of $758 in the above example. It may not seem like a whole lot, but why wouldn't you do it if the process was the same, easier even? Next is residency. Now obviously, as Venuans, the goal would be to avoid becoming a citizen of any government, but unfortunately, that's not very practical. Therefore, since most everyone will choose residency in some state, why not choose the one with the most legal benefits? Become a South Dakota resident in under 24 hours. Once you've obtained your physical address, you simply complete the required government forms, gross, stay one night in a hotel, RV park, or Airbnb, and trudge on down to a South Dakota Department of Motor Vehicles office. The local bureaucrat will ask you for the receipt from where you stayed and provide one document proving your identity, date of birth, and lawful status, one document verifying your social security number, and you're done. You're now a resident of South Dakota, and it took less than a day. And you aren't even required to live in South Dakota. Hell, you don't even have to visit again if you don't want to. So what makes South Dakota advantageous in terms of legal interstices? They put together this list. Becoming a resident is simple and painless. You will pay no state income taxes there is none. No inheritance tax, no personal property tax, no annual vehicle inspections, low-cost registration fees, and 4% sales tax. Compared to the communist state of Illinois, those benefits could certainly be beneficial. Now that all of the governmental nonsense is out of the way, I'd like to conclude this section discussing three tips and tricks that might help you out in pursuit of this lifestyle. First is hygiene. How do van nomads stay clean? Well, some van nomads have showers aboard their rigs. Others are in the wilderness enough that taking a dip in the creek suffices, but almost all van nomads have a membership to Planet Fitness. It really is a no-brainer. For $21 a month, you have access to their shower and workout facilities, and Planet Fitnesses are everywhere. The regular hot showers are great, sure, but what if it rains for a few days straight and you're cooped up in your van? Cabin fever is not outside the realm of possibilities. Being able to get out of your van to work out would seemingly be a major blessing. But that's not all. With your Planet Fitness membership, you'll also have access to unlimited use of hydro massage, unlimited use of massage chairs, free haircuts, and free Wi-Fi, among other things. So you could do your morning van life vlog, go work out and shower, upload your video to YouTube, and get a haircut. So I'd recommend you pony up that $21 a month. You'll be glad you did. Next is a AAA membership. If you aren't familiar, this yearly subscription service offers roadside assistance, emergency battery service, fuel delivery, lockout services, tire services, and more. They offer three different tiers, Classic $58 a year, Plus $93 a year, and Premier $123 a year. As an example, let's take a look at their mid-level tier. For your subscription, you qualify for up to four 100-mile tows, emergency starting, battery service, flat tire service, fuel delivery, vehicle locksmith service, extrication, winching, car travel interruption, emergency check cashing, and more. Breakdowns happen. They're inevitable. Don't leave yourself stranded, forced to pay for a tow that will inevitably cost more than a yearly AAA membership. Lastly is medical. Clearly without a full-time, 9-to-5 job, it's safe to say that most van nomads go without health insurance. So how do van nomads get dental work done, medical care, or medical supplies? This is one of the major hurdles for me. Without health care, there is no way in hell I could afford my diabetes supplies, mostly thanks to this fascistic, socialistic health care system here in so-called America. So how did I overcome this obstacle? I posted in a couple van nomad groups on Facebook, and lo and behold, there are other diabetic van nomads. Within minutes, the biggest hurdle is out of the way, and the answer is Algodones, Mexico. Algodones is smack dab on the border of Mexico and Arizona, a short 25-minute drive from Yuma, Arizona. Algodones has been featured in such publications as Forbes magazine for their high-quality medical tourism industry. Many van nomads have documented their trips there, and it basically looks like an American city, albeit without the ridiculous barriers to entry. English is the primary language, so you won't have problems communicating with your dentist, pharmacist, or doctor. So what about the cost? Believe it or not, you can get the same prescriptions and medical care as you would here in America, but for a far cheaper cost, even without health insurance. Ah, the freer market. As another alternative, you can obtain health care without going through an employer here in the U.S. For example, I recently found out that I can get basically the same health insurance I had when gainfully employed for just a little more a month. $245 a month to be exact versus $150 or so. 
Clearly, I'd rather not have to pony up that monthly payment, but it beats the hell out of paying full price for diabetes supplies. I'm sure I'll learn a bunch of other tips and tricks once I hit the road, but those are the most common ones. So why should you consider van nomadism as your first Vanu lifestyle change? It's the easiest lifestyle change available. Unlike sailing the open ocean, most everyone has experience driving a car. Sure, there are some obstacles and hurdles, but they aren't too much to deal with for the dedicated freedom pioneer. It's one of the cheapest lifestyles out there. Recall the average monthly cost for this lifestyle, $500 to $1,000 a month. Most people pay that much or more for their stationary dwelling in the servile society. With that expense out of the way, this enables you to work less and utilize that time doing whatever you decide to do. Also consider that when individuals lose their jobs or their homes, what are they sometimes relegated to doing? Living out of their car. Now obviously, this scenario isn't by choice, but that alone should really eliminate the fact that this lifestyle is extremely cheap. It's immensely freeing and rewarding. What if you could make all the money you needed and more, working half of the year and doing whatever you wanted for the rest of it? What if your scenery and front porch view could change from the desert one day to the ocean the next? What if you weren't tied down to a fixed location for years on end, working a job you hate, to pay for a house that you basically likely only sleep in? Better yet, what if all of those things were well within reach? Van nomadism is a terrific interim lifestyle. For me, the dream is still to find freedom on the open ocean, but I'm not going to wait around to be free. Therefore, van nomadism serves as a great interim lifestyle. In Vanu Book 2, Letters from Rayo, he writes, quote, I have never maintained that motorized nomadism is a panacea. I did choose it for and have found it to be an excellent interim lifestyle for someone still extensively involved in the servile society through earning money, seeking a woman, etc. Even if your end goal is something different, why not begin to live free in the here and now? The modern van nomad community is incredible. You don't have to do this alone. As I said, van nomadism is kind of trending right now. One YouTube search will garner months of content, but this van nomad community does not only exist in the digital realm, it also exists in the physical realm. This is one of the things I'm most looking forward to. Many of these folks are Benuans, they just have never heard of the word. These are individuals who, for whatever reason, decided that a normal life in the servile society was not for them. Instead of political crusading and begging the masters to change the system, they pursued direct action and created a life they desired for themselves. Even if we have differing economic opinions or whatever, these people are serious, and I can't wait to meet them. To give you an idea of how many van nomads are out there, let me tell you about RTR, or the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. Every January in Quartzsite, Arizona, van nomads from all across North America meet for a week in the desert to mingle, learn from each other, and get help in building out their vans. In 2018, some 4,000 nomads were in attendance. I'm hoping to attend in 2020. By that time, there will likely be well over 5,000 nomads in attendance. To conclude, I'll end with a quote from a nomad who wrote into Innovator in March 1968. Quote, so far, I have been too busy to travel extensively or to seek out especially attractive campsites. But already, I have lived many exquisite days and evenings at beaches, mountains, and forests. I am still learning the way of a modern nomad, but already, I am free. End quote. You've just heard an unofficial teaser of the audiobook for Vanu, A Strategy for Self-Liberation by Shane Radliff, narrated by the author. To purchase the paperback or download it for free, please visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash book or libertyunderattack.com to check out our full selection at LUA Publications.